system for state employees. This is about half an hour. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, legislators, justices of the Kansas Supreme Court, my wonderful wife Mary has joined us, my fellow Kansans, welcome to the first day of winter. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty amazing outside. Good evening. Glad to have you back in town. Our family has just experienced its first wedding with our oldest daughter, Abby, marrying Eric Tietzel. And uh, this was an exciting, thank you. It was exciting, it was emotional, and it was very expensive. So I need to get back to work, and it's great to see you and being able to get back to work with you. Let me start off by saying that I am bullish on Kansas. And as I go through some of the things tonight, you're going to see why. We're a state in transition from a high-tax state to a low-tax state. From a state struggling to pay our day-to-day -day bills to a state with a healthy bank account. From issuing more bonds and borrowing from our kids to paying down our debt. From <laughs> We're transitioning from losing private sector jobs to growing our private sector workforce. From an unsound pension system to an honest, defined contribution system. From a school finance system trapped in litigation to a simpler system focused on getting dollars out of the courtroom and into the classroom. We are transitioning from a Medicaid system lurching between cutting providers, patients, or both, to one that gets better results for our most vulnerable Kansans. From a modest wind energy investment to a top five states for projects under construction. From a wasteful, use it or lose it water law doctrine state to preserving our most precious natural resource, and that's fresh water. This state in transition will look less to what Washington can do for Kansas and more to what we can do for ourselves. Now that's a lot to accomplish. Can we get it done? Of course we can. A year ago we met here facing two really enormous challenges. A stagnant economy with fewer Kansans employed and a big budget deficit. Now many states across the country were struggling, but in 2010, Kansas ranked among the, wor among the worst 
in private sector job creation. But working together, we acted. And here are the results. We overhauled our state's economic development system, enacted modest tax relief, and sent word around the world that Kansas was open for business. And since January, 11, since January of 2011, Kansas has added more than 11,000 net private sector jobs in one year. <laughs> On the budget, last year we faced a $500 million deficit, but we didn't raise taxes. Instead, we cut spending, because clearly the era of ever-expanding government had to come to an end. In fact, for the first time in 40 years, the budget for the state's all funds spending actually went down from one year to the next. By applying these fiscally conservative principles, you, the legislature, turned a $500 million deficit into more than a $100 million surplus ending balance, and you did it in one year. Congratulations. <laughs> the Kansas legislature got its job done on time and under budget. Thank you for doing that. Now, those are the facts, and it's why now Kansas is considered one of the 10 best managed states in America. And it is also for these reasons, Mr. Speaker and Mr. President, that I can report to you that the state of our state is strong and getting stronger. Now, last session, the legislature gave our rural communities a new tool to help them reverse their population loss, and they have embraced the Rural Opportunity Zone program, offering no income tax and buying down of student loans to new or returning residents. Joining us tonight is Benjamin Anderson. He's the CEO of the Ashland Health Center. Benjamin, if you stand up, I would appreciate it. His hospital, like many rural hospitals, has struggled to attract medical professionals. Since the Rural Opportunity Zones has gone into effect, Ashland has recruited from out of state doctors, nurses, and social workers. And I met with Benjamin today, and he was telling me they're not, plan they're not stopping there. They're planning to recruit a dentist, a physical therapist, and two more nurses, and they have people calling them. That's the kind of population reversal we need to see taking place in our rural counties. Congratulations. <laughs> And I would presume you'd tell me, Benjamin, anybody that wants to move to Ashland, you'd be happy to have them there and take care of them at the hospital. Still, the economy remains one of our most pressing issues. Now, well, there certainly are factors that a state cannot control when it comes to its economy. Taxes are one area that we do control. Now, when it comes to taxes, we have some of the highest in the region. Now, this hurts our economic growth and our job creation. To address this, I'm proposing a major step in overhauling our state tax code to make it fairer, flatter, and simpler. Now, my tax plan will lower individual income tax rates for all Kansans. It brings the highest tax rates down from 6.45% to 4.9%, the second lowest in the region, and lowers the bottom tax bracket to 3%. My plan also eliminates individual state income taxes on most small business income. As we modernize our tax code and lower everyone's rates, it is also time to level the playing field and simplify state taxes by eliminating tax credits, deductions, and exemptions while expanding assistance to low-income Kansans through programs that are more effective and more accountable. I firmly believe that these reforms will set the stage for strong economic growth in Kansas and will put more money into the pockets of Kansas families and businesses. That's something we have to do. We've got to grow. We simply have to grow. 
And with this growth, this will allow us to further reduce tax rates and increase our competitiveness even further. Growth that will see people move to Kansas instead of leaving our state. And with that in mind, I ask the legislature to limit further growth in government expenditures to mo no more than 2% a year and devote all additional revenues to reductions of state tax rates to make us more competitive. <laughs> this will get us ever closer to the pro-growth states with no state income taxes, which are among the country's strongest economic performers. It also will enable us to keep the lid on state sales taxes and property tax rates by providing robust economic growth. Let's put our lost decade, where we lost private sector jobs last decade, in the rear view mirror and speed ahead at 75 miles an hour to make this decade the decade of growth and job creation. Now on the budget, when I took office last year, the state had just ended the last fiscal year with only $876 in the bank account, excuse me, $876.05. I immediately instituted a policy of prioritizing expenditures and studying our structural problems. This process required some difficult choices. Last year when I addressed this body, I said that any fundamental solution to the state's budget problems must include reforming taxes, Medicaid, our pension system, and school finance. We also had to face the fact of steep and continuous decline in federal money coming to Kansas. That's a new reality. In the last year, working with a committed group of cabinet secretaries and this legislature, we began implementing these needed reforms, and today, I'm pleased to present the results of this process. Now, my proposed fiscal year 2013 budget provides for an ending balance of $465 million, exceeding the 7.5% statutory requirement, and that for the first time in years. This budget fully funds or increases funding for essential services while holding the state general fund expenditures below last year's levels. This budget begins to address the long-term structural issues that place this state in years of fiscal peril. Now concerning our debt, this budget also addresses the state's ever-increasing debt that has created a generational burden sent to our sons, daughters, and grandchildren. State government is about to experience an influx of money in the expanded gaming fund with the opening of facilities in Wyandotte and Sumner counties. To reduce the burden we leave to our children and grandchildren, we should use this increased revenue for its most important statutory purpose, and that is to pay down our debt. It is what we should do with it, and I hope you do that. Now on CAPERS, for decades, state government has shifted the burden of providing state employees' retirement costs to future legislatures. It's always been kicking the can down the road. As a result, CAPERS has a shortfall of more than $8 billion. That's a huge hole. And the first rule of getting out of any hole is to stop digging. The CAPERS Commission, produce solid recommendations which will ensure that state government meets its obligations to retirees. Those who are currently receiving benefits or those who are vested in the current system will be fully protected. <laughs> and
and the state will increase its contribution to CAPERS and require more from workers to pay those benefits. But for all new employees and those not currently vested, we can and should transition to a defined contribution system like most private sector organizations all across America. Now the reason's simple. It guarantees that the state stays current in paying its bills and gives people the flexibility to move freely in and out of state employment instead of being trapped in our retirement system. State employees do important work and they deserve a fair and funded pension system. It's time we do these reforms put forward by the Capers Commission that does just that. Now on Medicaid, we are committed to a strong, effective safety net for our most vulnerable Kansans. Medicaid spending has skyrocketed in recent years and it continues to place stress on funding for education, for public safety and other essential services. With additional funding cuts expected from the federal government, Kansas must transform Medicaid into a system that improves services while managing costs. Now many states, they made the choice of either kicking people off of Medicaid or paying doctors and other providers less. Neither of these choices provides better outcomes. We have a better solution. The Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Jeff Collier, and our cabinet team, with input from legislators and more than 1,800 stakeholders, have produced a measured, innovative, compassionate proposal. Unlike the current one-size-fits-all system, we will offer all Kansans a choice of plans that best fits their needs. Kansans with long-term disabilities will have an integrated care coordinator. Those with developmental disabilities can keep their case manager if they choose. Many disabled Kansans want to work, but are stuck in government programs that provide neither respect nor independence. Now, I propose Kansas be a national leader in helping, helping the disabled find meaningful jobs. All Kansans should have the opportunity to pursue their dreams. With jobs providing an off-ramp from Medicaid, we will be able to help those in need of services and reduce our waiting list. For years, Medicaid was spread among several cabinet agencies in our state. This year, we will continue to make government smaller and better focused by consolidating multiple agencies into a restructured Department of Aging and Disability Services. By running government more efficiently and effectively, we can save money and provide better services. Now on school finance, it is clear that the people of Kansas know what's best for their kids. Parents know better than elected officials. Parents know better than federal bureaucrats. And parents know better than unelected judges. It is past time to get education dollars out of the courtroom and into the classroom. It is also time to deal with this problem. Now the plan I put forward, which many of you have already been briefed on and know, straightforward. No district gets less money and every district will get more flexibility. And I want to repeat that. No district will see its state aid go down. I'm proposing adding $45 million in state funding for our poorest school districts. I also propose to give local school districts more flexibility to spend that money in the way they want because the government closest to the people works best. And local districts should be allowed to invest in the excellence of their schools to the extent their voters believe is appropriate. As more districts make those investments, my plan establishes a mechanism which will protect poorer districts so that they too can benefit. Now some people ask me, why reform the school finance formula now? Can't we just kick this can down the road some more for another year? The fact is the lawsuit that's pending now is scheduled for trial this summer. And the people elected us, not the courts, to run our schools. It is time to do the new school finance formula and to do it in this legislative session.
Now this formula hasn't been adjusted in 20 years. The new school finance formula should be sunsetted after four years, thus ending the cycle of litigation and beginning a cycle of legislation. That's the way this should be handled. I hope you do that. Now one of the uh, honors of my professional life, or the honor really, of my professional life has been to serve the people of Kansas. People of Kansas have allowed me to serve as Secretary of Agriculture, as a Congressman, as Senator, and now as Governor. One of the regrets I have is that more has not been done to preserve our natural resources of water, particularly the Ogallala Aquifer. Almost since statehood, we've told Kansans with water rights that they must use it or lose it. This has encouraged the overuse of water, particularly of the Ogallala. I propose to repeal the use it or lose it doctrine of our water law. It is way past time we move from a development policy with our water to a conservation ethic. We have no future without water. Now it's altogether fitting and proper. It is altogether fitting and proper that we would do so. For our government is not only a compact among those who are living, but a covenant with those who are yet to be. Our great state is 150 years old. Many have come before us, and God willing, many will come after us. I'd like to recognize the first Kansans. Our Native American leaders are here with us tonight. And if they would please come forward and stand. From the Iowa tribe, Chairman Tim Rod. From the Kickapoo tribe, From the Kickapoo Tribe, Chairman Steve Cadu. From the Prairie Band Potawatomi Tribe, Council Treasurer Noah Wakwa Bushcook. And also join us. And I've got a special one for you. Also joining us tonight is Guy Monroe. Guy, please stand if you would. Guy is the chairman of the Kaw Nation also known as the Kansa Indians, after whom our state, Kansas, is named. And of course, this building is crowned with a statue of a Kansa Indian shooting for the stars. Thank you, Guy, for joining us. This last year, we also celebrated some of our most notable Kansans. We had the Kansans of the sesquicentennial, the top 25, and it was an inspirational time. One of the most inspirational was Clyde Cessna, the man responsible as much as anyone for making Wichita the air capital of the world. When we look at the achievements of these great Kansans, it's easy to overlook the fact that for, even for them, not every day was a successful day. They knew tears in their time, setbacks and reversals. Clyde Cessna survived 13 crashes before he achieved a successful aircraft design. Now, I might have quit after four or five, but he, he found 13 ways the plane wouldn't fly before he decided he found the right one where it would fly. Now, last week, Kansas received some rough aviation news. We suffered a setback. But even in the face of that, we see hope. Yesterday. I was in Wichita to announce an agreement with Bombardier Learjet, which will see that company expand its workforce in Wichita, and we aren't done. There will be more. Because, like Clyde Cessna, we're not going to quit. We're going to keep trying, keep innovating, keep growing. We're going to keep our faith in a loving God and a promising future, working together and praying together for a better Kansas. Now, I began tonight talking about my daughter's wedding. 
What a wonderful day. Now, seeing your child get married, which some of you have seen and been through this, inspires a few tears and many emotions. For one, it makes you feel very old, uh, or shall I say, really, more mature. But it also reminds us of why we're here, that our season is short, the needs are great, and the people, particularly our children, are depending on us. Now, you as legislators, you sacrifice a great deal to be here, and I appreciate that, and the people of Kansas appreciate that. You leave your homes, your businesses, your communities to come here and to serve the people of Kansas. I thank you for what you do to make this a better state. I really do, and I say that on behalf of the people of Kansas, because I know you don't always get people saying thank you or always appreciative of what you do, even though every one of you, no matter what political affiliation or what stripe, is seeking to do the best for the people of the state of Kansas. And I appreciate you, and the people appreciate you. And I can say, together, we will succeed for making this state and into making this state a better place, for we must. Thank you. God bless you all. And may God continue to bless the people of the state of Kansas. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.